Here's Jason Craig. How are y'all? How you guys doing? Thanks, Ian. Really appreciate that. Uh, today I'm here to talk about effective intrusion detection as opposed to uh, crappy intrusion detection. I have a lot of thoughts on this topic. Uh, I hope to share some of them with you now. Uh, so who am I? Uh, I'm Jason Craig. Uh, I'm an eng lead on the detection and response team at Dropbox. Uh, the people you heard yelling are my colleagues. Thanks for that. Um, I have the opportunity to work with a lot of really smart people. Uh, we're also hiring. Here's my contact info. Uh, you don't have to write this down. It'll come up later. So uh, firstly, thanks to B-Sides. Uh, we should all say thank you to volunteers. We should say thank you to sponsors and the organizers. This is a nonprofit. Uh, yes. This is a nonprofit, community-driven conference. Uh, so say thanks. Uh, here's the agenda for this talk. Uh, I'm going to spend a lot of time on three and four. Uh, not that interesting. We'll go through it. So disclaimers. Um, I initially had 30 minutes for this talk. I have a little bit more now. Um, I think this talk is probably at least a 50-minute talk. Um, I'm not sorry about that. We're going to go fast. It'll be a little hectic. Sorry. Uh, additionally, this work is a collective effort. Um, I've had the opportunity to work with a lot of really smart people over the years, and these ideas are not all mine alone, uh, so I, I don't claim that they are. Uh, this talk is also mostly about free and or cheap and or open source solutions. Uh, there's a time and a place for commercial stuff. Thank you. Um, and I, I definitely don't want to disqualify commercial software either. Uh, we find it super useful. Uh, you may as well, but this will not be that talk. Also, the slides will be posted, so don't worry about writing stuff down. Uh, let's talk about some assumptions. Firstly, uh, I, I'm a strong proponent in attract-driven defense. I encourage you all to engage in this methodology as well. Uh, Zane Lackey has a great talk about it, a few years old. It's still great. Go check it out if you haven't seen it. The assumption is that you should be attacking yourself first. This will lead you to be able to detect things that you wouldn't have found otherwise. So you can do this. Uh, daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly. You can do it with an annual penetration test. You can do it with a red team. Uh, choose your own adventure, but you should be engaging in this type of activity. Uh, secondly, uh, a few words about proactive hardening. I'm going to assume that you're all patching your systems. Like, this is 2017. Uh, if you're not patching your systems, you are negligent, and you should be sued. And you should feel really sad. So I'm not going to tell That's like 15 minutes of those 93 hours. Uh, it's really sad, so I'm not going to talk about that. Everyone should be like this tall to ride the internet, like H.D. Moore says. Uh, you shouldn't be operating if you're not patching your stuff. Uh, Chromebooks, iPads. So in this day and age, if you are faced with malware and implants and exploits that are directed at Windows and or Office, why are you running Windows and or Office? Uh, I, don't, I don't hate Microsoft at all. I, I actually like Microsoft a lot. Uh, but if that's your attack space, why are you not running a Chromebook or an iPad? Just a thought. Thirdly, uh, everyone should have mandatory two-factor authentication on everything. If you don't, that's also kind of sad. We all understand this, this problem we face today with password reuse. Uh, we all understand how effective phishing is. Uh, if you don't have 2FA on everything, you really need to do that. It'll save you and do it as many places as you can. Uh, I personally would advocate something with a push mechanism and or a security key, i.e. U2F. They are the only things that can't be phished. If you are using Google Authenticator, that's great. Uh, advanced attackers will fish your 2FA codes. Just a thought. Google has open sourced uh, the password alert extension for Chrome. Uh, you might surmise that they've been using that for a number of years internally. It's probably a great idea to do so yourselves. Uh, you don't need necessarily to use their Chrome extension. Uh, a number of other organizations have implemented their own, uh, which is a non-Google version for Chrome and or Firefox. It's very effective. I encourage you to use that. Also, another thought on phishing. There are a number of cloud-based authentication providers that one can pay a lot of money for, or a little bit of money, and alleviate the password problem. So for example, uh, there are now cloud-based authentication providers whereby 
uh, you no longer type in a username or password anywhere. You have an application on your phone. When you auth to an Active Directory protected endpoint internally in your corporation, you get a push. You literally never type your password in anywhere. In fact, your employees don't even know their passwords. Just a thought. Uh, a few notes about social things. Uh, be nice to people in your organization. We're not known necessarily for being an approachable group of people. Uh, we have a bad reputation. Uh, we need to work on that collectively. This will pay dividends for you in intrusion detection. Make friends across your orgs, uh, both internally and externally. This will also pay dividend, dividends for you for effective intrusion detection. We also have a linguistic problem. We are a group of people that's known for using a lot of buzzwords, even amongst ourselves that are not easily understandable by people outside of our groups. This is something we need to work on to be more effective. You should consider every employee you have a canary. They are all eyes and ears uh, for you, and they will help you. You can't possibly hope to see and hear all the things that, that they're privy to, but if you encourage them uh, to reach out and report suspicious things, it'll be really helpful for you. We all know, uh, that more advanced attackers are now pivoting onto personal accounts because they don't have the same protections that corporate accounts do. Uh, there is a lot of data to suggest this has been really popular the last two years, and you should take it seriously. Uh, we're a big believer in Slack bots. Uh, I think this is not an original idea. Slack is probably the first one that's talked about it publicly. Um, I encourage you all to, to investigate those. They will be force multipliers for your security teams. They can provide timely, uh, quick, and effective methods for you to crowdsource weird stuff in your environment. You push to people and you ask them, did you do this? I saw this really dodgy SSH connection outbound. And they can say yes or no, and then you spin up a response. Uh, if they say yes, you can then do an out-of-bound push via some other mechanism uh, to get them to authenticate that they actually did that. Uh, I don't know of any, uh, any organization that's been effectively attacked this way yet. Just a thought. Also, make friends with your help desk. Uh, they're your eyes and ears as well, and they will see a lot more stuff than you will ever see. So please befriend them, be nice, uh, and they will help you. So let's pivot into the third topic, um, tool talk. I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw up a bunch of stuff, a uh, bunch of different free and or open source and or cheap product names uh, that I've seen work in organizations, and then we'll talk through some examples after that. Uh, so firstly, on the topic of logging, there's a lot of great commercial software out there. Um, we use commercial software. Uh, we also use non-commercial software. We're big proponents of both. Uh, Elasticsearch and Kibana plus Elasticalert from Yelp is a, is a great stack. Uh, I've seen that be very successful. Windows event forwarding from Microsoft, also very cheap, uh, pretty close to free. Uh, scales nicely if you have Microsoft environments, uh, and I encourage you to check that out. Uh, OSEC is a lot more than a logging pipeline, but it can do logging as well. Uh, Greylog, also nice. Uh, Stream Alert, my former colleagues over at Airbnb just released this uh, in the last couple of weeks at Enigma. Uh, it's pretty fantastic. It is not exactly a sim, uh, but it's on its way to being a sim, so I encourage you to check that out as well. Um, on logging, some primitives I would encourage you uh, to embrace. Firstly, log as many things as you can. Uh, you never know when it's gonna rain, and you never know when you're going to need the data that you're not logging. Store it in one place if you can. Uh, this gets really tricky as you mature as an organization, but it, it's, a, it's a good primitive to adhere to if you can. Keep things as long as you can. Uh, we try to keep stuff for 18 months. Um, that may be a little excessive, but a lot of modern breaches are how many? 300 days old now? Keep data far back uh, as it fits your org, but I encourage you to keep as much as you can. Uh, on the topic of logging maturity, uh, I'd encourage you firstly to build blacklists of bad behavior. After you've done that, uh, after you have version zero of that, I'd encourage you to start looking for abnormal things. Abnormal, thing, abnormal things will consume most of your time. Uh, it's, it's hard to discern gray, uh, it's easy to discern black, it's easy to discern white. When you have reached a point in your maturity uh, on logging where you need to start automating things with your sim, uh, you should take a moment and congratulate yourself. 
because it's actually kind of a big deal. Uh, if you, I'm not gonna throw up the, uh, the eye chart with the maturity pyramids for incident response or uh, any diamond models or kill chains, uh, but if, you're, if you have that problem, it means that you are very mature. So take a moment and embrace that. Network security monitoring. Uh, there's a lot of great commercial stuff out there. I'm a big proponent for Bro. Uh, if you need to do signature-based intrusion detection, Suricata or Snort are good options for you, uh, both free and or commercial. Uh, that's all I'll say about that for now. We'll come back to some examples later. Um, well, that's not all I'm gonna say, actually. Uh, I'm not gonna read this to you. It's kind of an eye chart. Uh, this was said at Enigma 2016 by the head of Taylor Access Operations, uh, arguably the world's most elite hacking unit. Uh, they're worried about network taps. And if they're worried about network taps, arguably everyone else is too. As you'll likely see uh, over the next examples, um, I'm a big proponent for a client-centric approach to security. There's still a place for NSM. Uh, it's belt and suspenders. You can argue about which one it is. Uh, probably suspenders. But it's a, it's a good thing to have uh, after you build client instrumentation. So uh, here are some tools that, that I've seen be very successful with the Mac OS platform. Uh, OS Query, mostly maintained by Facebook. Uh, it's pretty amazing. You should check it out. It gives you a rich set of telemetry on an endpoint. Santa, uh, which is an application whitelisting solution from Google, um, also free, gives you a rich set of telemetry about execution-driven events in your environment. If you choose to, you can actually whitelist apps and have things get blocked automatically. Um, if you don't choose that, you can run it in a detection mode where it audits executions, and it's a pretty rich set of data. Uh, audit, the audit framework is built into the OXX kernel. It can provide you a lot of data there as well about process executions and or network telemetry. Um, regular Apple logs, you should obviously be collecting too. Uh, and, and a few notes about custom agents. So you'll see this on every OS that I'm discussing, both Mac, Windows, and Linux. Uh, there's a time and a place for a custom agent. A lot of attackers that uh, more interesting organizations face know the endpoint tools that you're running and are adept at either subverting or neutering them. A custom agent is very effective at telling you A, when your tooling has been subverted, and or B, doing things that those tools can't do. Uh, there's a few custom agents running around uh, that I've seen, and they're all very impactful, very effective. Um, there's also some commercial stuff out there that's pretty good, depending on what you wanna do. There's some commercial stuff that's pretty bad. Um, that's a talk for another day in beer. Let's talk about Windows. Uh, I think I probably annoy my colleagues a lot talking about Sysmon. I'm a big fan. I've been running it since August of 2014. Uh, we've been running it for a couple of years now. It's pretty amazing. Uh, so thanks to Sysinternals. It's a Sysinternals ma maintained product. It's free. It's performant. Uh, it works really well. It provides execution-based logging, um, parent and child process tracking, uh, network connection activity if you choose to configure it that way, and a host of other information. Uh, Swift on security has been talking about this stuff lately, so that's great. Uh, I'm pretty happy because she has a, a pretty big megaphone to talk about stuff. Uh, and she's been pushing a bunch of Sysmon configs to, to GitHub. I'd encourage you all to check those out. Uh, log PowerShell. Please log PowerShell. And don't log default PowerShell. Uh, you need to enable script and module logging. Yes, it's a bunch of data. Yes, it's kind of duplicative. Yes, it's kind of a mess, but it will save your bacon. Uh, We'll return to the Memicat stuff later. Uh, you should obviously be collecting the regular system logs as well, application security and system. Uh, there is some commercial stuff out there uh, that works pretty well for Windows. I would argue the Windows commercial space is much better, it's much better than the Mac OS space right now. And I think that's all I'll say about that. Um, custom agents for Windows too, good idea. Uh, Linux, most of us I think run Linux in production. Not a lot of people run Linux in Corp. Uh, whether you run it in Prod or Corp, whether you run CentOS, Red Hat, Ubuntu, Debian, whatever, uh, these are all applicable. The audit framework is really powerful. OS Query, again, uh, maintained by Facebook mostly. Um, they might have a bunch of Linux servers they care to protect. I don't know. System logs, you should definitely be collecting those as well. 
And uh, a new introduction to me at least, uh, IMA. IMA is pretty great. You should check that out. So let's, let's pivot to examples now. I'll give you a moment to, to look through this. So I don't know if you'd noticed, but John Podesta has a really great recipe for lobster risotto that's on the internet. You can go check it out. <laughs> for those of you that, uh, that aren't laughing, uh, John Podesta worked for the DNC. Uh, he was targeted by alleged Russian hackers last year. Uh, this is the actual email he got. There's nothing I've altered. It's literally a screenshot of the email that's, that you can go find if you choose to go search for it. It's a really good phishing email. It looks pretty legit. It looks so legit, in fact, uh, the DNC's internal help desk said it was legit. <laughs> so again, back to hardening. If you view 2F, this will not hurt you. Yes, your password will be stolen, but no one will be able to log into your account. So let's effort some examples on cloud-based logs. Uh, we'll start with Gmail, then we'll pivot to Dropbox, obviously. Uh, so firstly, I can't see anything, so I won't say show of hands. Uh, I suspect there are a lot of people that are Google customers that don't do log ingestion. And uh, I have anecdotal data to support that, and I have uh, non-anecdotal data from talking to colleagues uh, at other companies that are Gmail shops that are like, what do you mean there are logs? There's an API. Whatever your email service provider is, whether it's Office 365, get on your PowerShell, whether it's Gmail, like. They allow, I don't know, 10 or 15 different ways to interact with Google Apps APIs um, as admin, so, so please do that. Um, here's one example that, that we see of uh, me logging in. Not very informative. It's great. It's like we have a login success. Uh, the type was a password. Good. We have the user. That's me. The IP address uh, I redacted, but that's one of our San Francisco-based uh, IPs. So if we were going to effort some analytics on this log corpus, what might one do? Um, there's not a whole lot here to effort except IP address. So I'll take a short aside uh, to talk about IP addresses uh, that we can apply to other domains as well. Uh, so firstly, build a blacklist. Make friends. Uh, trade, trade war stories about who's attacking whom and what IPs. There are a lot of public oracles one can ask about IP address quality. Uh, work on that first. Build your blacklist. And if one of these IP addresses in an auth log pops up from one of those, then freak out and engage your IR procedure. Secondly, after you build a blacklist, start building a suspicious list. And when I mean suspicious, I mean like, is Tor exit node? Tor is okay, but like we might want to go look at that more. Secondly, uh, is it a hosting provider? Is, is, uh, is my CEO logging in from OVH in France? That's probably not cool. Like those are things that one could easily, in theory, catch. Um, is it an open proxy? Is it a non-commercial VPN? You can mark these things up and then effort analytics based on those. And then thirdly, start looking for anomalous behavior. So like for example, am I an SFO like 24-7, 360? Five days out of the year, am I maybe in Austin? But I never visit Lithuania. Those are good things to, to pivot off of. So this is a great opportunity to Slack bot an alert push out to someone and say, hey, we noticed you logged in from such and such. Is this really you? They can say yes, and we hope that the way we built that tooling, that uh, we have a strong assertion that they haven't been compromised. So in addition uh, to password phishing, I think an often neglected area for Gmail phishing analysis is authorized apps. Uh, this is far easier to perform as an attacker. I don't know why they don't do it more often. Uh, but here you see uh, the, the Dropbox employee who I've redacted giving this app permissions to their Gmail. This is an actual thing, IFTTT. Like, this is an uh, automation provider. This is an external entity that now has access to our internal email mailbox. Fun fact, you will note two values here. You will know that there is a Google user content apps URI, and there is a friendly name. There is no Oracle any of you can go ask to say, is this legit? Is this the app I know it to be? 
outside of performing that action yourself and seeing like, hey, maybe that happened, maybe it didn't. One can forge a friendly name for anything they want. So watch out for that. So we'll talk about Dropbox logins a little bit. Um, this is uh, a query that I've slightly modified, like for, for it's a pretty advanced query um, to display. So for example, we are pivoting off of all login activity for Dropbox, Dropbox for business source types where the employees are us. Uh, we look up an IP address database that we have internally in our SIM. We then search that through this suspect table and then we, pivot, we pipe that out to Slackbot responses and we search our Slackbot responses to see if an employee has said uh, this suspect thing is actually approved or not. And then we output a report that says like stats list these things. Super, super helpful. So let's dig into this a little bit more. Just like Gmail, these are what auth events look like for Dropbox. Uh, the IP address is obviously internal in this case. The timestamp's right. I redacted a few things for, for readability. Uh, but again, apply that same IP address analytics uh, to this login. Like, is it blacklisted? Is it suspicious? Is it unknown? Uh, and or is it approved? So a note about uh, cloud provider logging, like not everyone logs equally. It's, it's not always a great story depending on who your cloud provider is. Uh, we actually provide mobile device IP changes so that when you have a client on your phone and you pivot to a new IP and you're a business customer, we expose this data to you. That's great if, for example, uh, you have an employee who uh, suspiciously pops up in a rogue country when they're actually in your office. So let's talk about some fun stuff. Uh, Windows Office Macro Implants. These things are pretty popular these days. So in the spring of 2015, uh, we were targeted uh, by this technique. Uh, we got a resume.doc lure. It was pretty crappy. A bunch of employees reported to our internal phishing alias. Uh, our crowdsourcing training really worked well. It's fantastic. By the way, this went by all the security solutions at the time. So our mail provider, our security provider for your email, our client telemetry, all went right by. Crowdsourcing really saved our bacon here. Uh, in this case, um, it would have dropped plug X. Read into that what you want. Uh, we'll take a look at how we can how we can discover this type of activity on endpoints um, and extrapolate to a larger class of problems uh, via Sysmon. So this is the actual phishing email we got. It looks really bad. I think it was intentionally this way so that someone would click enable macros. Uh, so. so what do we do next? So here's actual logs from Sysmon. If you're, if you're familiar with the Windows event log reader, this is from Windows event log. You will notice here that the parent shell, or excuse me, the parent process is Explorer. That's your login shell. You will notice that the image is winword.exe and we're trapping the SHA-1 for winword.exe. There's a timestamp, there's a logon GUID, and there's a process GUID. You can track these GUIDs uh, for login activity, you can track it for process chaining, it's pretty awesome. In addition to that, you see the command line parameter that Sysmon traps to actually open this file. So I'm opening resume.doc, it's on my desktop, it's in a folder called to do. Next, you will see winword.exe calling command.exe, slash c, invoking cscript, and cscript is calling this WSF file. Like this is super dodgy, you shouldn't see this. You will also see winword.exe invoking command.exe with the slash c parameter and expanding out this cab file. Also not something winword.exe should be doing. So I'm gonna skip a few, few steps. There's probably five or six other interstitials between uh, where I left you off with that and where we are with this one. Apologies, this is terrible to read. Um, so at the bottom, what we have is a com object. At the very bottom, parent command line is this x blah 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 dot com, which is invoking this other binary called starter.exe that's running out of app data local temp. The end result of that is that we now have a new service installed. This service is called Starter, and it's named Kaspersky Antivirus Launcher. Super cute. 
So let's take this one example uh, that we were hit with in the spring of 2015. And let's extrapolate that out to the larger problem we have of office macro malware. So we have this technique uh, that was very discrete. We have other samples outside of this specific resume.doc. Um, there are some consistencies amongst all those things. And back to, um, back to attack driven defense, as an attacker, you would want to utilize a variety of different techniques uh, for invoking office macros to install your implants. There is not an infinite list. There are only so many ways one can do this. So you solve it once, you solve it for this entire class of problems in your future, and hopefully you should be great at detection. So a few examples, like WinWord shouldn't call CScript, it shouldn't call WScript, uh, it shouldn't call cmd.exe space C, it shouldn't call PowerShell. That's just not a thing that happens. It's incredibly rare. And if you are using Syswan to look for WinWord calling these child processes, you will catch all of this garbage. It's super easy. So this class of analytics covered our spring 2015 campaign and a few others. So uh, Alexity put up this blog post uh, right after the election about an APT29 campaign that got a lot of traction. There were over 2,000 targets. It was pretty big. Uh, APT29 is pretty advanced, I think, by most people's logic. There were five lures that they used. Some were zips with LNKs inside them. Uh, there's one other I forget. And then two out of those five techniques uh, used office stocks with macros. And they called PowerShell. So our spring 2015 uh, campaign analytics framework we applied to the same problem in the fall of last year. It still works. It's great. I'd say that's like pretty good win. Let's move on to PowerShell. Uh, so invoke memicats.ps1. So I'll explain what that is. So uh, memicats is a class of credential stealing attacks for Windows, whereby one attempts to either inject or dump or interact with the memory contents of LSAS on Windows systems, which is where all the secrets are stored. It's where your password stored, it's where your hashes are stored, it's where your curb tickets are stored. Uh, it's been around for a while. Uh, the latest hotness is a memory resident PowerShell uh, commandlet. It's actually not that hard to catch. It's, it's pretty easy once you implement PowerShell logging with script and module logging. So these are actual events from our environment. Uh, this was a pen test sometime in the past. Uh, we caught them in the first hour they were on site. They were really surprised. And we didn't tell them how we caught them. So we let that game play out a little bit more. They thought they'd get tricky, and instead of uh, using invoke memicats, they're like, hey, we're gonna alter the PS1, and we're gonna, we're gonna invoke pandas. They totally won't catch this. Again, caught that. Super, super easy to catch once you know how to hunt for it. So a few things about this. Uh, first of all, PowerShell is making network connections. Uh, it's invoking a couple methods, uh, i.e. invoke expression slash IEX, um, and it's calling a network connection method in the command parameter itself. These are all really, really helpful things to alert for. Once you solve this for memicats, you solve it for PowerSploit, you solve it for Empire, you solve it for NPS, you solve it for every other PowerShell-based attack language out there. It is super easy to do once you do it once. So again, back to attack driven defense. You should be attacking yourself with PowerShell as many ways as possible. Uh, once you start doing that, you will discover that there are so, only so many ways for one to call, call out to a network connection. There are only so many ways to interact with memory. So let's move on to MacStuff. MacStuff is pretty hot right now. Uh, this is an actual event from our environment. Uh, this is a red team event we had sometime in the past. The plist that this Apple update binary belonged to is called com.apple.appleUpdate. Totally legit. In this case, it was a SSH-based implant uh, that got invoked from LaunchDeep. It made network connections out on 443, but it wasn't SSL. In this case, I think the opportunity for analytics are like A, uh, is this plist rare in my environment? Have I seen this hash before? Uh, what kind of network connections is it making? Does that make sense? 
uh, what's the IP addresses it's talking to. So in this case, uh, I've redacted the IP. Um, that was an Amazon IP. And uh, they thought they could blend into the traffic by squawking out to Amazon because we have a lot of stuff in Amazon. So if you've never touched this Amazon IP before, uh, that should probably be a thing that, that you look for. Another output from OS Query uh, that was super helpful, again, from the same exact thing. You will notice uh, OS Query has trapped someone typing SSH agent dash L. Uh, people in finance never do that. <laughs> never. Ever. Uh, and we have data to support that assertion. I'm guessing, I'm guessing that you probably haven't had people in your finance department uh, list their SSH agents either. You can extrapolate this out for other demographics of people too. That's a whole other talk itself in analytics and demographic cohort analysis, but it's another day. Um, let's talk a little bit about Santa and how you can use Santa for finding fun stuff. So this past week on Twitter, uh, this document was really popular. It basically is the first advanced-ish, widely available uh, Mac OS X implant that came from an Office macro. Uh, you can go check out this tweet. You can go find this sample in VT and download it and play with it if you want. I think uh, Patrick Wardle blogged about it too in some detail. This is actually using the Mac Empire framework which is a free open source solution you can use to attack yourself with, or apparently advanced adversaries can also use to attack you too. So this is kind of an eye chart. Uh, I'll walk you through a few things here. So in this advanced doc you can download, um, there are some default um, Empire things in it. And you might want to hunt for default Empire things because one of these people might get sloppy, um, or they might put this code in there intentionally and you can catch it really easily. So for example, if you were to go search GitHub, uh, you would find this path, which is in the middle section of the eye chart. Path is bin shell. It's calling PS, and it's grepping for little snitch. In this case, uh, this implant makes a decision to back out if little snitch is detected. Probably why it's there. This is super easy to catch if you just know how to look for it. Uh, so, uh, I've seen this somewhere today. Is he here? Anyways, so um, the advanced threats of this week have caught up to what he was doing in 2015. So it, it doesn't require uh, that you be a nation state to have the resources to attack yourself in ways that nation states will attack you with. Let's move on to network monitoring. We're almost done. Uh, so, again, there are a bunch of great commercial solutions out there. Uh, I'm not going to talk about them. I'm a big proponent for Bro. Uh, Bro is a network security monitoring platform that usually works on high-speed networks pretty well. Uh, it parses a lot of interesting data off of the network traffic. You can get a lot of cool stuff that you can't get a lot of other ways. So, for example, uh, if you enable the Bro SSH parser, you can get SSH client and server version logging you can put this data somewhere and then action on it. So, for example, you see a Debian SSH string up there, and it's coming out of a Mac laptop. That's pretty weird. You might want to go look at that. So that maps directly back to that up Apple update uh, Mac implant I discussed a few slides ago. Super high signal if you start looking for it. In the last couple of years, the Bro framework has gotten really good at doing file transfer analysis on encrypted traffic. SSL is not magic. Uh, you can still parse SSL and get meaningful data out um, and make assumptions around the size of the transfer that occurred. It's, it's not hard anymore. It's great. Uh, passive DNS, you can take this passive DNS data and you can ask whatever oracle you want about these domain names and make quality assertions about them. It's pretty great. You might get passive DNS history. You might get registrant data. You might get uh, hosting providers and then be able to pivot off that stuff. It's, it's pretty fantastic. It's also uh, well equipped now to search for SSH reverse shells and tunnels. Uh, in the last year or so, 
this has been implemented uh, pretty, pretty nicely so that as an implementer, one doesn't have to write a lot of stuff to, to get this analysis done. It's almost out of the box now. Uh, in addition to that, uh, Bro can pull certificates off the wire for SSL transactions. You might want to go hunt for certificate grammar in your SSL connections. Uh, one fun thing uh, a guy named John Althaus did uh, about a year-ish ago was he was like, hey, I'm going to find all the interpreter certs. So he did that. And then HD Moore issued a patch the next day and changed the logic for finding the interpreter certs. And he's like, challenge accepted. I'm going to find the new ones too. So one fun thing you can do with this is just find an interpreter. Really easy. If this is in the framework now. You don't have to do a lot of work to implement it. Uh, in addition to other certs, they're rare, uh, that have specific grammar that you want to hunt for because you know there's a bad actor behind that cert grammar. Uh, this gives you the ability to do that uh, at scale, pretty quickly, and efficiently. Another fun thing that Bro, Bro gives you is user agents. So for example, if I'm on a Mac, uh, I should not have a Debian Firefox user agent coming out of my Mac. Super odd. Those are high signal things to alert off of. And again, back to Snor Snort and Suricata, um, there are a lot of signature feeds one can subscribe to for free. There are a lot of low cost ones, there are a lot of high cost ones with uh, different degrees of efficacy. Um, you can write your own. That's all I got. Uh, questions, comments, I think we have time. Uh, I had to include like a cat pic, so there it is. Cool. All right, cool. Thanks for your time. Um, I'm going to post these up so you, you don't have to worry about recording stuff, uh, email addresses, whatever. Uh, thanks again. All right. All right, thank you very much to Jason. From our sponsor Fitbit, a special gift. You'll never guess what it is. Um, and special thanks to our sponsors Fitbit and HackerOne. Um, a reminder that at 1.10 we will have the raffle. I believe it is next door. Um, we also have right now the lock picking workshop upstairs and the resume writing workshop over at Buzzworks. Um, I believe the next talk is at 1.30, back on schedule. So thank you very much. Enjoy your lockpicking lunch resumes and raffle, and we will talk to you shortly. <laughs>